Well, welcome everyone and welcome back uh, for those who participated in Tuesday's webinar. This is the second of two, which is looking at uh, gender and, and, and leadership in higher education. And with us today, we have um, Rebecca Schindel, who's going to chair the webinar, um, Robin um, Helms from American College of Education, Linda Chellan, Joanna Reglusa, and Chris, Kirsten Rem. And I think we're going to have Linda Chellan Lee coming in. She's not here with us yet. Um, this webinar is joint. Uh, it's uh, being mounted by, uh, ultimately really by the Center for International Higher Education at, at, at Boston College. I must give you credit, Rebecca, for really getting us going. And, uh, and in conjunction with the American Council on Education, and it's really good to have CIHE and AC and CG all connected in this way. Um, let me take you quickly through the webinar protocols, which on Tuesday I put into the chat. I think I'll, I'll put them on screen this time. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on, on our web website and may well be posted by CIHE and, and or ACE. So Rebecca can tell us about that when she feels ready to do so. Um, we'll also post the transcript of the chat function conversation. Our postings on the CG website are being picked up on YouTube and we're finding more people are picking up the webinar now through YouTube than uh, through direct participation. Now, during the webinar, please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or you want to ask a question. Um, there's no need to have your video on either, um, but please, of course, turn both your audio and your video on when you come in to participate in the webinar. Um, we recommend using speaker view in Zoom, the top right hand corner there, so you can more clearly see who is talking at any given time. We're gonna have a large number of people in the webinar and I think you'll find that setting is the most sensible one to use. Um, now, to ask a question, uh, to enter the Q&A segment of the webinar, which Rebecca will, will handle, um, use the chat function. Put your question there uh, and then Rebecca will know uh, whether and when to select you in. And, and I would say that if your question is relevant to the topic that's being discussed by the speakers and it, uh, it comes in early enough, then she will be able to include you in the Q&A. Um, when you're invited to ask your question, please unmute yourself and turn on your video and then state your name and your affiliation, where you're from. Um, I'll pass over now to Rebecca. Rebecca's, uh, the, to get this right, Rebecca, hang on just a sec. Ah, yes, the Managing Director. Yeah, Managing Director of the Centre for International Higher Education at Boston College, a very valued colleague uh, and, uh, and who's been working with us at CG for quite a few years. Uh, and Rebecca will introduce our other speakers. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, thank you for all to all of you for being here. Um, and as, as Simon mentioned, we are really thrilled to have this um, two-part webinar series this week, um, jointly organized by CIHE and also by CG, um, and also American Council on Education. So a tripartite uh, organization this week. Um, really, it's been exciting to see it. And I also think it's a really nice manifestation of the way that CIHE works. For those of you who are less familiar with the Center for International Higher Education and might be coming to us through the CG mailing list, you may not know that we've been uh, in operation as a comparative higher education research center since 1995 at Boston College uh, in, in the United States. And really the way that we work is in collaboration with others. So in collaboration with individuals and also research centers around the world. And I think that this, um, this whole project kind of does a nice job of of exemplifying that way of working. It also um, sort of exemplifies another aspect of our mission, which is to do evidence or uh, to, to, to scholarly analysis and research that is useful um, for informed policy and practice. And certainly that's um, at the core of the briefs project, which is what this two-part webinar series is about. So um, CIG and ACE for a number of years have collaborated on a series of international briefs for higher education leaders. I'll let Robin talk a little bit more about the project, but this is the ninth iteration of the brief. Um, and this ninth iteration is focused specifically on the topic of women's leadership in higher education around the world. And this two-part webinar series looks at the findings from that brief. If you missed Tuesdays, um, please do take a look at the recording, as Simon just mentioned. Uh, Tuesday's session was really looking at the, the comparative aspect of the brief. So looking at a number of different contexts and the state of play, if you will, of women's leadership in higher education in those contexts. What might what were some of the, what are some of the similarities that we see across country 
and also some of the differences when it comes to the question of gender equality in leadership. But what we wanted to do with this second webinar is pick up on a very specific theme that ran through many of our contributions, and that was the important point about diversity within the question of gender equality. So yes, in itself, it's important to think about how many women are who are, who are aspiring to leadership positions in higher education are able to access those. But it's also important to nuance that and think about what kinds of women are able to access those positions, what kinds of positions they're able to access, and what kinds of institutions, in what kinds of institutions they are able to pursue their, their aspirations. And that's what we really hope to look at in this, um, in this session. So I'll turn it over to Robin Helms in a minute, who's Assistant Vice President of Learning and Engagement at ACE, to talk a little bit about ACE's uh, perspective, and then turn it over to the actual panelists, the four contributors to the brief. Um, so just briefly, so that they don't have to spend too much time introducing themselves, our four panelists today are Joanna Rogoska, who is Vice Provost and Dean of Global Affairs, and also Professor of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at University of California, Davis. She's actually joining us from Poland today, but that is her affiliation. Uh, Linda Chalen Lee, who's Professor of, of Political Science and also Director of the Research Center for Sustainable Hong Kong at the City University of Hong Kong. Ashley Gray, who is Senior Research Analyst at the American Council on Education, and Ashley's portfolio there does look particularly at ACE's efforts to support women in higher education. And then Kristen Wren, who is Professor of Higher Adult and Lifelong Education at Michigan State University, and I might add a proud alumna of Boston College. Um, so thank you so much, and without further ado, I will turn over to Robin. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. As Rebecca said, I'm Robin Matras Helms, Assistant Vice President at the American Council on Education, or ACE. Thanks to those of you who are able to join us for our first webinar on Tuesday. I'm excited to be here with you again today. As on Tuesday, I'd like to start by thanking our hosts, the Center for Global Higher Education. We're grateful for the invitation to again feature the new briefs publication and to engage with a second group of stellar authors in today's conversation. We're also grateful to the Boston College Center for International Higher Education, or CIHE, for their partnership, not only on this installment of the brief, but for the longstanding and fruitful collaboration between ACE and CIHE over the past decade. The International Briefs publication has been a cornerstone of this collaboration. As Rebecca mentioned, this installment is the ninth in the series, which began as a mechanism to deliver concise, action-oriented information to U.S. higher education leaders seeking to establish partnerships with institutions abroad. Over time, with support from CIHE and its global network, the publication's scope has expanded to focus on global higher education issues with a comparative lens for a truly global audience. We're especially excited about this installment of the brief because it brings together a number of ACE's current priorities. As a bit of background, ACE serves as the major coordinating body for US higher education with about 1700 institutional members representing all sectors of US higher ed from community colleges through doctoral institutions. Our work focuses on advocacy, both in the formal policy sense and serving more broadly as a voice for US higher education inside and outside the US producing high quality research and delivering programs designed to empower leaders and transform institutions. Women's higher education leadership has been an integral component of ACE's work for decades, including our robust ACE Women's Network and Moving the Needle initiatives. Diversity and inclusion, the particular focus for today's discussion, are all longstanding commitments for ACE, brought to the fore all the more by incidents of racial violence and calls for action in the US and around the world. And we're currently in the midst of a strategic planning process for ACE's global engagements. A key priority for us going forward is bringing comparative perspectives to critical higher education issues. This installment of the brief with the insights and recommendations it provides for advancing global women's leadership, diversity and inclusion represents exactly the type of work we hope to do more of in the research realm. And this week's comparative discussions among experts and practitioners from around the world are a great example of the types of events the ACE seeks to be part of on an array of global higher education issues. We hope there will be many more of these conversations with all of you going forward. And with that, I'm excited for us to get started. Many thanks again to the Center for Global Higher Education, CIHE, our panelists, and to all of you for being part of today's events. Rebecca, back over to you. Thank you so much, Robin, and I will just pull up our slides here and then I will turn the floor over to Joanna, who is kicking us off. Go ahead, Joanna. All right, well, um, 
Thank you so much to organizers. This is truly a tripartite uh, global effort. Um, and I am really pr feeling privileged to, to be part of the brief. Um, the brief that is uh, very close to my heart because I have been doing work and research on women's empowerment, women's leadership, women's participation in uh, political arena, but also in academia. And I am sure for those of you who are part of uh, today's webinar, you know that women are underrepresented in the research. Um, and it's a, it's a pyramid. Uh, majority of recipients uh, of undergraduate and master's degree across the world you know, are women and uh, they make about half of the PhD recipients. And yet, when we look at their representation in the research, uh, only on the average, uh, global average, 28% are women. So clearly, this is a pyramid, pyramid with a very strong base, uh, but a weaker uh, top. So, of course, the question is what is happening and why do we have such an underrepresentation? And uh, this underrepresentation, under of course, varies tremendously by country, by region, by discipline, by institution. And there are uh, cases where, of course, gender parity uh, in research and academia is achieved. And then there are, of course, many other instances where this is not uh, the case. Uh, the pandemic uh, a year and a half has obviously am amplified inequalities across many sectors and of course higher education has been affected also. Um, so we know that being a woman and a woman of color in academia these days means that our professional career progress will be more challenging and then the persistence of certain inequalities might be further uh, exacerbated. And of course, one of the, the elements of which we need to remember, and recently we are remind that politics often enters the scene. Um, and I think uh, many of you probably heard about the recent case at North Carolina University at Chapel Hill, where Nicole Hannan Jones, a woman of color, the creator of 1619 Project, which celebrates uh, the history and uncovers the history, very painful history of slavery in the United States, has been denied tenure. And that that's just speaks to the reality of very complex situation, uh, what is happening to women in academia. So the barriers are very wide ranging. Um, the existence of some of these barriers we have acknowledged for decades, uh, but efforts to address them has been very selective. Um, sometimes things get, one thing get uh, fixed here, the other there. Uh, institution claims that, well, we have done everything what we could, and yet the selectivity of approaches of the decisions and policies that institutions implement are often conveniently chosen and often depend on the cultural practices of particular institutions. The level, for example, of risk aversion, the commitment to retaining status quo rather than embrace the progress and change, the commitment to donors who provide funding and then UNC case is exactly the, the good examples. So uh, rarely barriers have been examined collectively and their interdependence um, is being acknowledged and examined. Rarely institutional diversity has been recognized. More often, uh, the impact that these barriers have has been kind of minimized, simplified, just ignore. And it's a really hot pot and very uneven landscape, landscape how institutions address these, uh, these obstacles. And I would argue that the obstacles need to be seen within the full spectrum of complexity of the interdependence and through a nuanced lens of the very oppressive and differentiated impact that institutions, cultural practice, behaviors or legacies have exercised. These barriers are really intertwined and interconnected. So selective choices of fixing something here and there doesn't absolutely bring the, uh, the results that we expect. So it's not, the collective impact is not simply additive, 
but it varies depending on each woman's identity and circumstances in institutional context. And I would argue that we really need to commit ourselves to engage with and apply intersectional approach uh, proposed by Kimberly Crenshaw a few decades ago, and we're going to hear more about it uh, in our presentation later. So the, the sort of gender division of labor at work and at home and racial biases, conscious and unconscious, stereotyping and prejudice, ageism and sexism and so forth, they're all outcomes of how social categories have been applied to a particular person and how a particular person then will end up being discriminated against, marginalized or treated uh, unjustly. I would also like to underscore that while often these barriers are se seen simply as a question of gender justice, we need to commit ourselves to seeing them also as a question of social justice, economic justice, racial justice, questions of basic human rights. And I believe that that commitment to seeing things as an interdependent of these systems of discriminations, systems that create these advantages, are really critical uh, for us. Um, as I mentioned, there are many barriers and we're going to talk about, um, I think pay gap is notorious and visible barrier. And one could say, well, it's simple. We just need to pay women more. But that's where the issue is, that one reason why is it so difficult to eliminate it is because there are so many subtle and hidden cultural and institutional practices that have created these inequalities. Practice of advertising jobs. Where are we advertising? In reviewing applications, in interviewing, in mentoring, in providing access to information, in promoting, and so much more. And finally, um, I really think it's extremely important that we women have to support other women in whichever small and big ways we can. We need more women in leadership position so they can actually mentor next generation. And we kind of need to think about that sisterhood is local, not only global, but it's actually local within our own institutions. So finally, of course, a lot of um, debates are, well, we can do legislation and we can do policies, but I think ultimately it's the social change that need to be encouraged as well. Change in everyday cultural practice and professional opportunities in recognition, in awards, um, in, in mentoring and so forth. So I'll stop here and um, I invite my colleagues to continue the conversation and subsequently we can engage with the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I'm afraid we've had some trouble um, bringing our next participant in. Ashley, I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm hoping you don't mind if we go straight to you and then hopefully we can come back to Linda's part of the presentation. I think it works fine to flow right to your presentation as well. Is that okay with you, Ashley? Sounds like a plan. Okay, so I, I am here. Oh, you're here. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Sorry for that, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Ashley, P putting you back on where you were. <laughs> Go ahead, Linda, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, sorry, Ashley, okay. Uh, because of some hip cups uh, back home here. Um, well, um, this is, um, uh, well, tonight, uh, by the way, this is uh, nighttime in Hong Kong, okay, nine, nine o'clock uh, in the evening. Um, so um, we, we heard a lot about, you know, the difficulties, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting represented, uh, you know, uh, in higher education, not, not to say in the rest of the country, uh, in the rest of, of the societies. Um, I think um, when I, and, and, and when, when we, okay, because I, 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 I work with my co-author, Iris Cam on this, um, on this uh, little piece uh, for this uh, newsletter, um, surprisingly, you know, we encountered difficulties in getting Actually, quite uh, the, the the basic data that that we we find that uh, you know we, we need to analyze the situations. So tonight, actually, the in a few minutes, I, I just simply to talk about uh, you know uh, uh, the the need for um, uh, better data, you know, in in in, in our societies, uh, in order for actually I think the 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 discussion to proceed, and in order for 
you know, uh, policies to be uh, advanced, you know, uh, uh, in a more efficient way in the future. Because uh, I think uh, generally, I think uh, we, uh, we, 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 we all, you know, we know to convert it or always think that, okay, this, this, is, this is something important. But uh, a lot of times in the societies, people think that this is not, not an issue, okay? Uh, uh, think that uh, uh, gender is already, you know, uh, resolved, okay, in, in, in ex especially in Hong Kong, okay, Hong Kong is relatively affluent, uh, and despite of uh, a lot of other social issues, and people think that, oh, we got a, um, actually, you know, more than 50% of the, our students, our average undergraduates, uh, as uh, uh, female students, and so, so people think that, okay, this is becoming a non-issue already. Um, and uh, but in, in fact, you know, uh, uh, employment. When, when we come to uh, female employment in the universities, I think the situation is uh, it's rather um, uh, not satisfactory. So the data I show here um, uh, is actually uh, you know uh, show us that on average, okay, um, uh, the leadership role um, percentage of women it's about. 20, okay, looking at, 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 at the bottom uh, bottom row is 20% uh, out of a total just under 3,000 uh, uh, positions, uh, positions. Okay, so uh, these are the relatively the, the senior positions because I count only the management, uh, the deans, headships, okay, um, leaders of teaching programs, directors of uh, research centers, institutes, and uh, professors, okay, chair professors and full professors. Um, so 20% is actually, is not high, all right, it's just a one fifth. But uh, when you look at the breakdown, okay, uh, the lowest is actually in chair professors and chair and, and full professors, okay, there's just, just un, uh, over 10%. And then uh, for type management, we have a uh, 13%. And deans, okay, uh, uh, they got a quarter of them, heads is 27. Well, looks are not very low, but in fact, when we look more carefully at the breakdown, or okay, within these ranks, uh, you know, uh, women mostly uh, occupy the lower echelons of these ranks. So for instance, for top management, we include, um, of course, from uh, vice chancellors uh, or presidents, okay, in Hong Kong, uh, to uh, 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 positions uh, like uh, uh, associate provost, okay, or associate vice presidents. So um, um, uh, we, we, we find no women uh, for the top, uh, that is the vice chancellor or presidents or the pro provost positions, okay. So um, the 13.3% of women in these positions all were found in the lower echelons of these positions. And equally, most of the Deanships and headships, uh, about around 80% of those, okay, or, or out of this 24% would be for the associate deanships and associate headships. So, um, so it really tells that uh, the situation, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, much less, uh, I mean, the ratio of female leadership is much lower than, than, um, than, than these figures. Um, and I think uh, what is, uh, and moreover, the, this figure, is actually the uh, uh, comes out of a manual search from by by ourselves, okay. Uh, when we are preparing for this uh, little piece um, in November 2020, what does it mean by manual search? Which means that um, uh, we try to find uh, this kind of basic data from uh, existing uh, uh, information from our universities or our from our grant authorities. Uh, but uh, there is no available information of this type. Okay, even this this information is actually breakdown is fairly basic, but the available data uh, is actually uh, even more coarse. Okay, cannot tell us okay these these functional details. So we need to we need to actually uh, resort to a manual search. That is, we have to look at the, the website web pages of each of the universities. Go to the, each of the department. Okay, and then count count the names, okay? Basically, we do, we do it in a very elementary way, all right, and collect the original data and to arrive at this kind of a basic uh, basic data. So um, uh, so the situation of data, it really tells that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the difficulty of, um, of, you know, research 
and also you know it's a it's a tip of iceberg i would say okay this is really um tells that uh, uh you know uh, one simple way to improve um you know it's is to make available this kind of basic data uh in, in our public database and so that uh it is will be easier for uh all members of the society to 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 conduct um, uh, data uh, analysis and also to uh, uh, benefit, you know, deeper, deeper discussions uh, in order to reflect upon uh, whether gender issues are, are really uh, an, an non-issue already in Hong Kong. So I think um, uh, in our little piece, we also talk uh, obviously uh, about um, uh, uh, issues in legislation, all right, uh, in practices, and um, you know, uh, so uh, the lack of, in fact, in la lack of uh, debate, okay, <laughs> the lack of debate as such uh, in the society itself tells a lot uh, that uh, uh, that more needs to be done. Well, I would say I I will stop it here, just over a starter. Yeah. Thank you so much, Linda, for pointing out some of the. Um the challenges of even figuring out some of these nuances that we're talking about today. Now, Ashley, I will actually hand the floor to you. Thank you so much. So actually what my colleague Linda just pointed out is a, is a major issue globally uh, around the collection of data. Um, and in most cases, the lack thereof. So picking back up also what my colleague Joanna outlined for us, uh, the work of Kimberla Crenshaw, uh, we've got to have a very critical conversation. And I think data leads us as a conduit for truth telling. And I want us to sort of remember that sound bite. Um, as we think about this critical um, intersection that we're at right now, when we're thinking about black women in the Olympics and the recent uh, tenure debacle of uh, Dr. Nicole Hannah Jones, also I'd like to formally uh, welcome her to Howard University where she will always have a place. So I'm very excited that my alma mater has made a home for her um, as well as our brother ta Coates. Coates. Um, but these larger conversations lead us to have a very critical discussion on gendered racism, right? So this idea that the intersection of race and gender really create this dual oppression. And if you add any other identities on top of that, then we're talking about major margins here, right? Um, so my, my piece in this brief really does highlight the role of Black women um, and sometimes the intentional silencing of Black women and that, um, is situated from university spaces as well as situated from uh, performative allies um, and having a deeper conversation on the needs of, of what black women, um, what needs exist for black women. So my concept is really around this right to vote as uh, the US uh, women in the US largely were celebrating 100 years of the right to vote. It left this cognitive sort of dissonance for uh, for Black women in particular, much like when we talk about the Fourth of July, right? This Independence Day concept. Independence for whom, right? My folks were not free uh, during the establishment of this holiday, and so thinking about how these conversations create a tension, particularly for Black women, um, is a conversation I want us to continue to sit with, which leads us to the overall question in my presentation is equity for whom? When we think about this pipeline to women's leadership, uh, the advancement, our conversations on parity, who are we asking to lead institutions? It very much seems as though based on our numbers, and if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide for me, Rebecca, uh, based on the data that exists, that we are talking in some ways about a very specific group of women, which means we need to have a much more intentional conversation. So on these slides, I'm going to sort of walk you through the relationship between data and get us to policy and, uh, and praxis, um, how we can literally make changes on our campus. So I'll walk you quickly through the data on uh, women presidents in the United States of America. So in 2016, women accounted for about 30% of all college and university presidencies. And of that 30%, only 5% identified as women of color. Now we do a lot of great work in collecting this data. However, we had not disaggregated among that 5% what race and ethnicities uh, those accounted for. So we can effectively say that between all women of color, we are sharing a very sparse, very uh, low amount of presidencies in the United States of America, which to me signifies we've got a major issue here. Um, also in 2018, black women held just 3% of all faculty roles and were most often represented in non-tenure positions, the lecturer, the um, adjunct faculty member, 
um, which speaks to this pipeline on the presidency with the traditional pathway to the presidency being that of the academic route that you would become a professor and then a full professor, a dean, uh, chief academic officer and ultimately president. We've got some major issues here on creating a pathway in which black women feel supported um, and are able to advance in that space. Um, next, black women are paid significantly less money, less money, uh, which talks about that the gender pay gap, right? So now we've got this intersection of gender, but we've also got this intersection of race as we have this conversation. And this number looks different for uh, Latinx women. This number looks different for Asian women. And I want to point that out, that it's, it's important that we do intentional research. Because when we talk about globally what women need, we're often centering the needs of white women, particularly in US research. So we've got to be intentional to reach to other populations that may not um, be uh, present in the data. Last but certainly not least, Black women carry the bulk of student loan debt in the United States of America, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so it's important that we realize that we're in a very critical position and our colleges and universities have every opportunity to right this wrong. Um, so here are some policy and practice implications that I will leave you with. Um, number one, listening to black women. I, I particularly wore this pen and this is Anita Hill um, doing her con congressional hearing. And it's really about believing black women as the empirical experts of their own experiences. I know it sounds like such a strange concept, but we have to continue to reiterate that listening has to be the first step um, in, in making any change. In addition to that, early talent development programs, rotational leadership opportunities. This particularly came up in my dissertation research on six Black women college presidents who talked about their intentional rotational leadership as a critical juncture for when they knew they were ready for the presidency. Next is revising institutional policies to make sure that they're family friendly and have some flexibility. And certainly not least is reimagining what this tenure and promotion process looks like in the US, redefining what um, research service um, and teaching looks like and what counts in those categories. Oftentimes women and namely women of color are left to do sort of the social emotional work of the department. And seldom is that included in the uh, dossier experience, right? Those things are harder to capture. So as we think about service to Black women and where Black women stand in higher education, this concept of intersectionality, which was the inception of Kimberla's work. And I, I want to situate that really quickly. Um, I, I'm not sure about the certificate, but I want to situate us here with the research around Crenshaw's work being that there was an absence in the critical discourse for Black women. So if they were talking about Black folks and law, they were oftentimes talking about men. And if they were talking about women in law, they were oftentimes not referring to Black women. So this concept of intersectionality created by Crenshaw in 89 was really to situate the critical space that Black women were in and not given a voice in the data. Um, I'd like to leave us with just one question that I, I want us to continue to grapple with is um, when we think about equity, equity for whom, and then how do we get beyond performative allyship to really get to the real work? Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. And now if we could move to the last question, which is um, also equity in what spaces? So um, Kristen, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, some of you will find this particular topic a little bit niche, I would say. So women's colleges and universities. So these are colleges that continue, colleges and universities that continue to be ostensibly for um, female students only. Um, there's a whole separate webinar to be done about transgender students at women's colleges, but we'll just focus for the moment sort of globally. Um, so they're either, where you are, they're either fairly rare um, because there's very few of them in some countries or they're exceptionally common. They're like, predominant in where you are. Um, and as Joanna noted, um, more than half of undergraduate students in the world are women. So why do we even have these institutions anymore? So I've done some work on that. These were historically established to provide access to education. Um, they are absolutely decreasing in number in Australia, Europe, and North America. Um, they are holding steady in the Middle East and East Asia. They're actually increasing in India. There's a, an effort afoot to open about 500 more. Um, uh, there's very isolated efforts in Africa um, and a 2004 effort by Francesca Purcell, Laura Rumbly, and Robin Helms on the call um, actually did not turn up any at the time in South America. Uh, I have not been able to as well. If you have one or know of one, please let me know. I'd be thrilled. 
Um, and uh, if, if these sort of stars on this uh, map roughly sort of represent where they are, and if you uh, would like to know more about those, I'd be happy to uh, talk more. Next slide, please. So part of my research on women's colleges and universities and sort of why we have them, in addition to providing access, one of the things I've learned is that they're very rich context for developing women leaders, both students and then faculty and senior leadership. And so I've talked to a lot of women's college and university presidents, faculty, students, and alumni uh, in several nations and learned that they're very good places for academic women's leadership. Um, I've interviewed 20 presidents so far. Um, only two of those 20 were men, actually, and that was not uh, because I was a avoiding interviewing men. It's just that the proportion went that way. And thinking about um, things we've learned about some of the possible reasons that women's colleges and universities are such great places to develop women leaders and have women presidents. So first, the campus climate in general is more inclusive of women students, faculty, and leaders. So uh, people who work there report lower incidents of gender-based harassment and discrimination. Um, some of the presidents I interviewed and some of the faculty described experiences when they were at co-educational graduate schools or faculty positions, the kinds of barriers that they described there that they found they didn't have when they moved into the women's college context. So I think that's a factor. Also, women's colleges expect women to be leaders. Like there's just kind of we, it, is, it is a given. If there's a job to be done for students, um, they talk about like uh, we were having a play and we had to build the sets and I didn't know how to use a hammer and nails, but there were no boys there to do it. So I had to learn to do it. Um, it translates over to women presidents, right? Like, well, if, if somebody's got to do the budget, why not be a woman doing the budget? So there's definitely a, a way of cultivating leadership and sort of doing what uh, may not be expected for people of a certain gender. And then also there's a very purposeful effort to provide role models for students. Women's colleges and universities are quite active in their efforts to demonstrate to their undergraduate students or grad students that women can be leaders. Second, um, there's a strong tradition, and this happens at co-educational universities around the world as well, of institutions hiring their own alumni as faculty who then become leaders. So the desire to grow your own leaders, sort of bringing back people who appreciate the culture and have pride in your alumni. So that I think is another factor, like grow your own, hire your own alums back. And of course, the alums of women's colleges and universities tend to be women. Um, third, women's college and universities really do seek female leaders. They are actively looking for women to lead their institutions to represent them, uh, whether it's advocacy or with their alums or with potential donors. So they're really looking at people who understand the experience of being female in male-dominated careers and male-dominated settings. Um, again, as role models, but also to represent that institution to the world. And then pathways from faculty leadership to the cabinet. Again, this is a grow your own strategy. Women's college and universities worldwide tend to hire more female faculty than co-educational schools do. Um, this is true wherever I've visited around the world. Um, the pipeline therefore has more women who can rise up through the ranks to presidency. So you have more female uh, assistant professors, full professors, department chairs, provosts on their way up. Um, and then people do talk, the leaders talk about, they do face less sexism from their boards and from senior executives um, at their own institution. So a woman president of a women's college and university may say, even my own cabinet here provides is a less sexist environment for me as president than what I saw at my co-educational university I was at before this. So there's definitely sort of a, a campus climate issue. There's a, a pipeline issue, um, but women's college and universities are really rich places. In the US, we've seen a number of um, uh, people that sort of very fancy, very selective women's colleges go on to presidencies of quite elite research universities as well. So women's colleges and universities are also a pipeline to other kinds of institutions as well. So it's a really rich environment. Again, it's, it's a bit of a niche for some of you to think about this, um, but it really is a, a strong place for this. So I think it's time um, to go back to Rebecca and leave us some questions. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you to the whole panel, really. What we tried to do with this panel was to try and highlight some of the many different aspects of this question of diversity within gender equality, right? So we've heard, we know when certainly we talked about this on Tuesday, but many of us working in universities also just know anecdotally the many barriers that women do face, whether those are cultural, whether that's related to taking time out for reproduction or other caring responsibilities, whether that's to do with explicit sexism. But when you think about within that bigger question, how that even more affects particular women of color. When you think about how we don't know, um, we, we don't know much about that when you actually think about the data, when you think about 
different institutions that are, when if you look across the world, one of the other contributions in the brief looked explicitly at the number of women leaders in um, highly selective research universities versus other kinds of institutions. If you look at the kinds of roles, as uh, Linda was saying, you can really see how this question is much more nuanced than it's sometimes presented. So thank you so much to all of you for, for bringing those contributions in and for Kristen for, for ending with, I, I think, what is potentially an inspiring counter countercultural um, example of what it would be like potentially if the world generally expected women to, to, to fill these roles and what that might look like um, in the broader sphere. But at this point, I'd like to turn it over for questions. There haven't been too many. So I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions for the panel, please go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, the way things work in these webinars is I will call on you to speak them as um, Simon said at the beginning of the webinar. So it looks like the first question, which is a, a very interesting one bringing in the pandemic context uh, is coming from uh, Glenn Chatelier. So Glenn, if you wouldn't mind turning on your mic and asking your question to the panel. Uh, thank you. Uh, in, in, you know, as my question posits the the, the background, uh, you know, the, the the COVID pandemic is really a game changer in the management of higher education, and uh, I'm just wondering whether the COVID pandemic would also be the opportunity to bring about gender equity in HEI management. You know, uh, because I believe that there's a lot of scope. And even in the context of my own university here in Thailand, I found that many of the women leaders, albeit at the lower level, are playing pivotal roles in changing the culture of education. So uh, do you think that this would, uh, would be uh, something that we can talk about as a positive trend development in, uh, in diversity representation in HEI? Thank you. What do you think, panel? Is the pandemic going to give us an opportunity here? Does anybody want to, to take that question? Well, um, well, I think you know one one um, one merit of um, of the pandemic is that it's actually reminded us uh, a lot of these uh, old questions or classical questions or questions that has been with us for a long time, but uh, a lot of times are, are not. Uh, are kind of being neglected or people are not talked to uh, uh, paying sufficient attention. I think um, uh, I think uh, equity issues, okay, including gender issues, uh, they're, they're one of them, okay, or, or obviously class uh, issues, okay, uh, the problems of um, uh, 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 housing, you know, uh, uh, family impact on 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 on, on things, you know. Uh, so so these 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 topics have been um, more discussed uh, across societies and certainly in the media as well. Um, uh, so so to that extent, I think it it should it might be helpful. Put it that way. Uh, but again, I think um, the impact it's it's uh, sometimes. Um, uh, may may varies a lot from country to country and and from sector to sector, and and certainly I I have to say that um, uh, the discussion is not it, it it's not vibrant in Hong Kong, uh, uh, well supposedly you know for very obvious reasons because uh, uh, relatively speaking uh, gender uh, it's not a priority these days. Okay, Hong Kong has much tougher and tougher issues <laughs> on our table. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, right now, uh, well, we have had a, a female chief executive. And so, um, uh, so on the service, you know, uh, we have the number one job uh, being held by a woman, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, at the same time, you know, um, uh, uh, I think as our paper has, uh, has, has documented, uh, actually, uh, we, I, I don't think we have we, we, we didn't make any progress at all, okay? Uh, not to say uh, uh, in the higher education, but uh, in, uh, in, in other arenas as well uh, uh, on, on, on gender issues. Um, uh, but I think uh, I agree uh, to some early discussions, you know, uh, 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 Joanne uh, mentioned this, uh, women rights or women issues is part of a bigger and more daunting issues of human rights. Okay, so, so, so uh, yeah, I think I, I will stop it here. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Maybe I'll just add, um, so 
I, I, to some degree, I'm optimistic, but I'm also not. And, and I think what the pandemic did, it one more time exposed the, 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 the issues. One more time, the issues came to the surface. One more time, there was some discussion. But unless there is a willingness to follow, this is gonna be a short window where the, we discuss, we talked, and then the kind of status quo will continue to take over. So, so I think it really depends so much, quite frankly, on us as women to keep that conversation and that debate going. And I think the, the webinar like this, mentoring programs, uh, writing and so on, we have to do it because the system has to be changed. And, and, and so just the conversation is not enough. And that's where we need a much larger collective involvement to start changing the systems within our institutions. Thank you, Joanna. And I, I, I think I would be remiss not to note that um, maybe there's an opportunity, but also clearly when we look at the data, um, the pandemic has made this a lot worse for a lot of women, not better. And um, you can see that in two different ways. You can see that in the very obvious way, sort of um, as Ashley was mentioning in her in her presentation, the ways in which the pandemic has much, much more negatively affected women in general and within that women of color in terms of less publications, less opportunities, more childcare responsibilities, more taking care of homeschooling, responsibilities, those kinds of things. And there's been quite about quite a lot of work done on on the negative impacts of the pandemic. But the other way that you can see this happening in a negative way actually looks on paper like a positive way. And I think this is part of why we're trying to get at some of the nuance in this webinar. For those of you who may have read about this sort of glass um, cliff phenomenon, um, that women are getting more leadership positions within the pandemic, but those are very precarious positions. Either they're short-term positions or they're positions with huge amounts of high stakes pressure on them where it's quite easy to fail. So yes, on paper, maybe there's some leadership happening within it, but when you actually break it down, I think that's part of what we're trying to get at today, um, what that actually means for women's leadership. But moving forward will be an interesting question. Ashley, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that question, given what you talked about in your presentation. Yeah, of course. No, I'm, I'm really glad you created that nuance. We tend to look at data and we say, oh, women aren't interested. And that could not be further from the case, right? For, uh, sometimes we need to take a deeper dive and ask why women are interested. So I, I, I heard the comment, particularly in our research around chief academic officers, uh, that you know women who were at that point expressed some disinterest in moving on, right? But there's a larger question about why the next natural progression would seem like such a punishment, right? So that means we've got to do some work at the systematic level to understand the needs uh, of women and why that seems like almost like punishment to be advanced. What are they seeing at the top that looks less than favorable? Are they losing autonomy? Are they losing some flexibility? Are we losing really money isn't everything. And I think if there's any group that's going to tell you that money isn't everything, it's particularly women. Uh, you know, women are, are largely impacted in making career decisions for family. Um, oftentimes meaning that we take sacrifices in the name of family. Um, and so I think there's a larger conversation here about creating nuance in the interests of women. Um, and there was one comment in the in the chat that I, I just wanna um, quickly address, um, or actually that came up in that conversation. It's around allyship and what's the role of men in this conversation. And I think it's getting beyond performative allyship. So as a, as a black woman, I think about that in multiple layers, right? So I think about that it would be particularly helpful if men in certain spaces would speak up, right? Would say, hey, no, let's disrupt that. Let's think about pay disparity. I also think in certain conversations, it's important for women who don't identify as women of color to be able to stand in the gap as well, right? So getting beyond the performance of allyship to actually get to the work, and that starts again with listening. So I, I, I did wanna just sort of touch on that just a little bit. Thank you so much, Ashley. And that's a great transition. I was actually going to um, ask So Young if she could ask her question. So Young, would you mind asking your question to the other panelists as well? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing me. Um, thank you everyone for your um, presentations. My question is about a male's role in this kind of conversation. Because when I attend seminars related to gender equality and women in higher education, speakers and the audience tend to be female dominance. So do you think if this conversation can go beyond 
less between us and to have more impact? Should male be more involved in this conversation? And I understand that it'd be less normal for male speakers to talk about women issues, but in what ways can this conversation involve male academ in uh, academics as well? Thank you, So Young. Do any of the other panelists want to address that point? I'll jump in on that point as well. I think that Ashley's point about you know um, allies is important. I think that there's been conversation in leadership development around the difference between mentors and sponsors. Um, and mentors are important to have, but you also need people who are quote unquote sponsors, who are um, men who are in positions of power, um, who are able to provide opportunities, invite women into those opportunities. So I feel like that's a specific role that men can take and men can be in places to advocate for women's leadership in ways. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, if men on a board of trustees or a governing board um, were the ones to, to, to lean into the idea of a female president at an institution, um, or that men in a cabinet were to get behind and really support a female president instead of trying to maybe tear her down or undermine her leadership. I think that would be really important in terms of promoting um, women's success in leadership positions. Thanks, Kristen. Does anybody else want to comment on that one or should we move to the next question? Yeah, I think I think Kristen uh, um, make a very, uh, uh, very good point. Uh, I think um, uh, rather than thinking of involving males, okay, in the discussion of female uh, issues, I, I, I think, you know, I, uh, we, we can bring in more stakeholders, okay, uh, that would be relevant to the discussion of uh, broadening the, the participation of female uh, in, in all walks of life, okay, or obviously in higher education and other uh, sectors of uh, social activities. And so uh, if we use this perspective, uh, inevitably, uh, a lot of males would be involved, okay, because at the end, you know, otherwise we won't need that, this, uh, the, the subject matter, the, the, the matter of discussion uh, of today, right? The matter is that a lot of the uh, 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 very important roles are actually being taken up uh, by, by males, all right? So, so inevitably, um, uh, males, uh, of course, uh, they, they need to be in place. Then the question comes back to us, uh, why not, okay? Uh, why not in, 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 a, in a lot of discussions? I think primarily that, 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 that reminds us of the, um, of the long journey that we have to travel still, okay, on, on this subject matter. Uh, because I think the, at, at a fairly early stage of, of, uh, of agenda setting or, or, or progress of agenda, we need to get those, uh, those uh, uh, members of the community who are the most interested, uh, so, so who have the biggest stake okay, in, in, that, uh, in that subject matter to be more involved. And, and, and I think that the very fact that uh, 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 we tend to, uh, I mean, that this kind of discussion tend to involve more, more females uh, really tells us that we are actually at a relatively early stage of, of, of the whole, whole, whole execution or the whole development of, 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 of these, um, I, I, I don't want to, to use the word movement, okay, because, but I, I, say, I, I think more or less, okay, um, I think um, uh, this is a very challenging process. Uh, in fact, when I was um, a few years back, that to bring us uh, very briefly, I actually have a bit of reflection why it is so difficult, okay, to 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 carry this uh, so-called movement uh, uh, forward. I think because uh, gender is actually a very sensitive issue, uh, because we all live in uh, uh, we, we, we 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 in any family we 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 we, we, we well, biologically okay we, we need to come from a uh, did. did a male and female, right? Otherwise, we, we won't have lives, right? Uh, uh, so, so I think so. So this is actually uh, very uh, emotionally very, could be very disturbing when we talk about power within, you know, in our very private lives, right? Um, so, so this is that. That's why we getting very difficult and, and requires a lot of capacity, not only intellectual capacity but also inter, uh, emotional capacity to over uh, to to address these issues and uh, to to confront them and also to carry them forward um, so yeah I don't know <laughs> okay but I, I certainly agree that we, we need to do more involve more, more discussions yeah 
Thank you, Linda. And also thank you for bringing in the point about um, different disciplines and subjects. Um, I think we have time for a couple of more questions. And I'm wondering, Mariko, if you, if you would be willing to ask your question about interdisciplinarity? Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, quickly, I just wanted to know, um, given this enormous challenges that we have faced in pandemic and in other social unrest, and uh, you know the program that the currently interdisciplinary program has been created, we have enormous uh, kind of a pressure to be very much uh, creative and innovative. Um, so, wonder the you know what do you see? in emerging area that the skills and the competencies are really required for those leaders currently they are on the road to you know executing their uh, responsibilities and then also uh, you know tasks that, that they are currently doing because as you know the MIT has just appointed uh, Dr. Nobles she's in, in the area of social justice and then also political science background I have been working with her and it's been really wonderful to see a very different uh, kind of uh, decision making and the governance model that MIT has taken. So yes, there is a, a challenge is that the, our background, you know, you can't change it where you're coming from, your background, but she's as African American was able to, you know, navigate a different rivers to be, you know, sitting on the uh, table to really hold the discussion uh, decision position. So I wonder that, you know, if you see any trend in foreseeing the future, how can we, you know, again, that help younger generation of, you know, different generation to come to um, different, uh, the trend so that they can prepare better for the future to really sit on looking at the better equity. Thanks, Mariko. So the possibility maybe of a more positive future as we think more about Inter interdisciplinarity and people coming from different perspectives and what that might do to create maybe some different norms um, that, that might be supportive for women reaching leadership. I'm, I'm gonna add on top of Mariko's question, a question from John Fowler, who is in a shared space. I can't ask his question out loud, um, but his question also is a, a question about possible opportunity in the future, looking at wondering if technology mediated communications that we are all so uh, familiar with now and in fact exercising today, whether these are going to positively or negatively affect these questions um, in the post COVID landscape. So I don't know if anyone wants to pick up on either of those, whether interdisciplinarity or technology of offers any hope here or potentially um, further concerns. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so as we think about inter this concept of being interdisciplinary, I think number one, uh, you know, for, for a lot of women, that's never been, um, there's never been any other option. You know, I, I think for many women, depending on it, particularly women researchers, women of color researchers, I've always had to pull multiple subject matters from multiple areas to be able to really drive home a point. So I think this concept of, of um, being interdisciplinary one highlights that a lot of folks have had to be interdisciplinary for all this time. Uh, and so I think we need to think about it um, in terms of a context of almost a privilege to be able to talk about one thing at one time, right? It kind of goes back to this concept of uh, intersectionality. Uh, particularly in my own research, I use a lot of like sociology, for example. And you will notice that on this pipeline to the presidency, that the degree that they're actually attaining is it's looking a little bit different depending on what pathway they um, use, particularly for the US presidency whether they're uh, traditional pathway, non-traditional, outside of higher education, et cetera. So I think their backgrounds are looking a little bit different. And I think boards are respecting the diversity of thought as well as the diversity of race, uh, you know, diversity of socioeconomic status. All of these things play a role in the well-rounded leadership that we get or that we don't get. The other piece that I'll say that it's important for leaders to develop is soft skill sets. We oftentimes think about what hard skill sets they need to have. They need to be financially sound. They need to be able to engage the board, alumni, all of these different um, bodies. We seldom think about soft skills in that, how they are able to build meaningful relationships, how they connect with students, how they respond, how they communicate early and often. So I would add those two things. Um, in terms of in terms of technology, I want to point out 
uh, still a very lived reality that there is a technology gap, right? There's a very real technology gap that's in, impacting folks of certain, certain economic status. Uh, and, and we know that particularly in the context of America, you can't separate race and socioeconomic status. They're, they're one and the same. They inform one another. And so I think it's an important conversation as we think about technology, technology for whom, whom has access to it, and then what does liberation look like through that? Thanks so much, Ashley. Joanna, did you want the last word before we close? Here you go. Um, I, I was just going to say that one of the area we didn't talk uh, much, but it is about the representation of women in the course materials, uh, representation of women in um, different disciplines, engagement, creating the visibility. Um, so rarely, we, when we think about engineering, we actually talk about women engineers and their contributions and their perspectives. So we can take it across all disciplines. And I think this is where the interdisciplinarity comes in uh, as a really bedrock to being able to address any of those barriers and challenges, discriminations and injustices as we talk. So that's an area where a lot of has happened, but still not enough. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you to all of the panel. I, um, we did not directly address Phil's question about solutions. I will say that if you're interested in this question and I'll post, post the link one more time, the brief did include also uh, some discussion of some solutions and policies that have been advanced. Um, I would say when you look across the brief, we had many contexts represented. This was maybe more evident on Tuesday's panel from countries with very small numbers of women at all to countries like Australia, Finland with very large numbers of women represented. But still, when you break it down and, and also in those contexts, many policies and programs supporting that process. But also when you break it down, even in the countries where you see great success, you, st you still see these same issues of what kinds of roles, what kinds of institutions, what kinds of people. So thank you so much for coming today and for listening. Um, I will just close with one uh, quick plug for those of you who are coming through the CG mailing list rather than the CIG mailing list, that if you'd like to participate in future CIG webinars, we'd love to have you. I'll post the email address that you should write to if you'd like to be added to our list. We are taking a break on webinars for the next two months um, with the summer, but we will be back on our monthly schedule in September. But otherwise, I will hand it over to you, Simon, for the last word. And thank you very much, Rebecca and the panel. Um, great to have these two discussions. And we really appreciate the time zone problem and you know the fact that it's difficult for our colleagues from North America to participate at, at 2 p.m. in the UK. Uh, and it's easier on the East Coast than it is on the West Coast, of course. So it's been great to have so many people tuning in for the, for the two discussions, given that probably what you'd rather be doing is having your first cup of coffee for the day. Um, so do come back uh, for our subsequent um, webinars. We're still running till the third week or the end of the third week of July. Uh, and we'll resume again uh, after a five week break at the beginning of September. So do tune into CIAHE webinars and do tune into ours. We're really grateful to the Center for International Higher Education and American Council on Education. It's really good to collaborate with both organizations. Um, really important and good work that they both do in the sector um, uh, within the United States and worldwide. Uh, we all greatly respect the uh, expertise and the, the capability of the professional staff of the um, of ACE and it's indeed its academic leaders uh, over the years, very inform informative for all of us. And of course, CIHE has carried, I think many of the global coordination roles in the higher education studies field for you know for a long time, particularly due, I think, to the work of Phil Orbach and Hans De Witt, but also now Rebecca Schindel and Gerardo and others who are now taking over. So um, we look forward to future joint webinars. Our next webinar on Tuesday, the 13th of July, is with um, scholars from the United States, in fact, Riyadh Sharjahan and Kirsten Edwards, who are going to present a brilliant paper um, which was published in March on um, whiteness as futurity and globalization of higher education, a paper which we've found very influential already and has been circulating widely here in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. So do tune in next week. But once again, Rebecca, especially, thank you very much. And thanks panel. Bye, bye for now. <laughs>